Patty Jenkins makes history as the first woman director to break all kinds of records, makes the most money personally and for the box office for Wonder Woman, right? The long-awaited sequel comes along three years later, and somehow it fails to even be about women, namely the woman in the title. How does this happen? How does this happen? I was like on the fence about doing this episode, right? But I was like, I kind of feel like I have an obligation to because I've almost been so involved in this Wonder Woman process because I've been reporting on it since the first movie came out. I was on the set of Wonder Woman 84. I covered the junket of the first Wonder Woman. I've interviewed the cast many times. So I was like, you know what? I feel like I got to get in here. I feel like I got to get in this bitch. Let me put it to you this way. When I saw the first Wonder Woman, it was in one of the press screenings before the big premiere in Los Angeles. And my parents happened to be in town and they came with me. And it was really exciting. It was so larger than life. It was at the AMC in Century City. If you guys have seen Crazy Stupid Love, that's the venue, right? That big shiny outdoor mall with Steve Carell and Ryan Gosling when he throws his shoes over the ledge. Okay. So that's where it was. And outside the theater, there was like a huge Wonder Woman poster. And you go inside the theater and you can just like feel that electricity, right? Because you're like, this is like history. This is the huge, like the first huge female superhero of our era. This shit's about to kick ass. And it was just so cool. And then I remember my mom and I leaving the theater. We felt so proud to be women. We kept being like this, right? You know, the thing like she would do all the time in the first one, like, yeah, I'm a woman, After we watched Wonder Woman 84 last night on Christmas night, my mom turns to me. She goes, I have a headache. I feel like that pretty much encapsulates where this is all going. What, like what just happened? What just happened? And I know you're probably thinking, oh, here we go, Taylor. Don't tell me you've joined the dark side. Don't tell me you've joined the woke, critiquing this movie, having issues with it, saying it needs to be more female forward. Uh, 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 uh. Well, I will say though, I was disappointed in the woke for once. N-G-L. I was like, where are you? I'm looking with my telescope. No one pointed out what I'm about to say today. I'm going to get to that. Why was this whole movie about Pedro Pascal? Well, I feel like there was the Pedro Pascal show. Why, why was it about him? Okay. Let me first get into my, my disappointments with the movie. And I'm no movie critic here. I'm just telling it how it is, especially as someone, like I said, who was invested and I was actually on the set of this. Okay. First of all, this is how the movie was described. And I love me an 80s joint. I have watched Stranger Things like three times through, no joke. I was deaf born in the wrong era. Hence why I can't stand the mob. They described it as a sharp contrast to the first one. Remember the first one? It was like super gritty. The backdrop was World War I. It was like kind of dark. Okay, so they purposefully said that this was going to be in the 80s because it was going to be bright and neon and fun and vibrant. And more importantly, it was in a time when people were really thriving, right? The economy was great and people were living in like, living the high life, getting things that they wanted and like, living in excess, right? So what happens, they said, when people get everything that they want? This was the promise. So I was super excited going into the movie, right? You even saw the posters of Gal Gadot and she was with like the neon and that whole thing. And I was like, this shit's about to be a blast from the past, back to the future. You wouldn't even know that this was in the 80s. The only dead giveaway was Chris Pine's fanny pack. That was number one. I was like, this is not what was promised. Number two, it didn't feel lighter and vibrant. It actually felt kind of weird and dark and existential, especially in the end, right? By the way, I was going to have spoilers. So take a little Bailey's, take a shot. You won't even know what hit you. It totally felt dark and weird. Even my dad, my dad turned to me after last night and he was like, that was just weird. That was just like straight up weird, right? That's like the only way to describe it. It was. My other thing was they came up with this whole convoluted mess to bring Chris Pine back. Even that, my mom looked at me and she was like, I'm confused. I was like, I think I'm still confused. I sh- I don't even know if anyone really knows what happened there. But they went through hoops to bring this man back and then he's barely in the movie. There's like a post-sex scene in the beginning for two seconds. And then in the end, they have a long tearful goodbye, which was probably the only redeeming part of the movie, sadly, 70, 100 hours in. And then the rest of the movie, he's just running alongside Diana as her sidekick. You're like, what was the point of all that? 
But here's where it's a bummer about the way that women were dealt with in this whole situation, okay? So one opportunity was Kristen Wiig's character, Barbara. She's this really geeky gemologist because Diana now in the 80s is working at the Smithsonian as an archaeologist, okay? So Barbara is this really geeky, awkward, out of place girl. She sees how like sleek and strong Diana is. And with this magical stone that's completely phallic. And if anyone thinks it doesn't look like a penis, you are one step away from Helen Keller. I'm sorry. I thought about it the whole time. I was like, I don't know if this is my dirty mind, but like who made this creative call? I'm not a comic book. I'm not well-versed. So I don't know if that was from the comics, but like, okay, there was that. So this stone grants you any wish that you want, right? And Barbara wishes to be like Diana. Now, in turn, she turns into the cheetah, who is this iconic character from the comics. In the comics, cheetah is this like slick, like has big boobs and has like the whole sexualized thing of a woman, right? In this one, when Kristen Wiig turns into her, she looks like a hairball from Cats. Not actually Judy Dench in Cats. No, no. The fur ball that she spit up in between takes. That's literally, you guys couldn't do better for Kristen Wiig. You, you couldn't do better. You guys know how I feel about this. There is empowerment that comes with a woman being sexual. Don't shy away from this. And you know what? They know this clearly because that's like Diana's thing. Like she always looks super hot. She has the boobs out. She has like the butt over and it's like, oh, oh, oh. When she goes on a fighting scene, you see a little like undie action. She always has a short skirt. So we know they know this. Why did they make the cheetah look like a carpet? So that was super lame, number one. Number two is how interesting would it have been to see this really complex dynamic evolve between these two women? When we were on the set, they talked it up like Kristen Wiig is going to have this awesome transformation and turn into this badass. And I was like, yes, like this is cool. I'm excited to see. To, and I'm not sounding super wokey right now. I'm going to get into why after. I was excited for that, but it was, there was no development at all. And they totally missed the mark. Like Kristen Wiig is so fun. Like in Bridesmaids, genius, genius. This, I didn't even chuckle at her awkwardness. I don't even think even once. Not even once. The only noise that was made was a snowplow outside. I don't understand. Like totally missed the opportunity to make her funny and then miss the opportunity to like really have these two go head to head and like really build up something interesting between them. Giving it the benefit of the doubt. I know that we're not watching superhero movies. Like we're not watching Man of Steel to get some, you know, spiritual awakening epiphany about life. I get that. But what a missed opportunity, man. You had these like two really cool women. Instead, Diana ends up chasing her around like the furball she is and electrocuting her. Missed opportunity. I feel like I barely saw Gal Gadot in this movie. Anyone else? I was like, is she like not the the part of this movie? Where, Where is she? The whole crux of the movie is about Pedro Pascal, how he's a greedy businessman. You know, a lot of the woke articles, of course, compared him to Trump. Not everything is about Trump, guys. And the downfall of a hungry, selfish, self-absorbed businessman and what happens. It just feels cheap. It's like we've seen it. And it makes me think about why these studios make the choices they make. Is this a big Trojan horse? I talked about it last night with my friend about these very things. And he said, you know what? These blockbuster movies, they're not working anymore because they all follow a formula. And he's like, you know what? Half the time, they're not even tailored for the US. They're tailored to do well overseas. So who knows why Pedro Pascal was the star of the show? They do studies. They do this. They do that. There are so many decisions that go into this. And I've had so many conversations today where it's like, is this studio taking us for idiots? Like, it's so clear that this is the most disjointed situation that has ever happened. I was literally watching it on some level. I was insulted. I was like, you guys have the audacity in 2020. We have been through enough and you're going to have us sit here for two and a half hours and expect us to not think that this is totally bogus, but to also enjoy it. These people are on the same page. Whoever made this movie, they are on the same page as Sleepy Joe and Kamala. It's just like, what? I saw a tweet that said the departments on this movie were on different edibles and none of them talked to each other. That's what it felt like. I don't know why they made the decisions they made. 
Like at one moment they were in Egypt. I literally turned to my mom. I was like, what are they doing in Egypt now? What are they doing? Learn from the Duffer brothers. You kind of had a whole fucking movie in the eighties arcade and we would have been happy. And like I said, I'm not looking for a life altering movie. I love escaping to superhero movies as much as the next fanboy. But at some point, when is the formula going to get changed up? Cause this was the perfect opportunity and it was missed. The whole thing is about this man, Pedro Pascal. We see him in his suit. We see him with his ears bleeding. We see him crying. We see him with his son. We see him running through a yard. I mean, we get it. We want more Diana. We want more Diana fighting. I want to see Diana kicking ass. I don't want to see Diana saving the world after she's gotten her ass beaten by giving this heartfelt speech about the truth and about sacrifice. No. I want to see her kicking his fucking ass weak. And it makes you wonder, is the studio doing this because they think a man at the crux of the movie will perform better? You know, it's kind of contradictory to my last episode, right? Because my last episode was all about how men are really getting bashed these days. And I feel like they should be celebrated as should woman, as they both bring totally different things to the table and that's okay. And that's what we love about each other and ourselves. But this was the one time I'm going to say it guys, I'm going to say it. And I, I love men and I support men. You guys know with my last episode, but come on, like this was an opportunity to be like by women, for women, about women. Every time I turn to the screen, it's Pedro Pascal crying or screaming. And this is what's interesting too. When it was time for women to sort of assert themselves in this one, right? And show their power, especially with Kristen Wiig's character. But people notice this too with with Diana is how repulsed they were by men on a range of just simply hitting on them to harassing them, which falls into the Me Too category. We're going to go here for a second. Diana is all dressed up at this party, for instance. And all these men are hitting on her. And it's actually kind of funny because I literally turned to my parents and I was like, this is me every time I exit the house. All these men come up to her and hit on her and she doesn't give them the time of day. She's like, move it along next. Move it along. I don't know you next. Nope. Sorry. Nope. That way. You're No, honey. Nice try. Go away. Okay. I actually thought that was pretty funny. I have guy friends who were like, cut us a break. Again, kind of pertaining to my last episode, right? We're just trying. It's like, we can't win. We, we, we damned if we do, damned if we don't. Damned if we try to hit on you, damned if we don't. Can't win. Which is a whole other ball of wax in and of itself. Because we all know it comes down to what we find attractive and what we want. If a hot guy hits on us, we're all for it. If it's someone we're not into, we're like, hit the hay. That didn't really bother me so much because as a woman, I actually found it funny because I was like, I, I, I totally feel like that when I go out. It's pretty funny to see that play out on screen. But what was interesting is when Kristen Wiig's character then, it really plays into that men are trash trope. So Kristen Wiig, in the beginning, she's this weak sort of prey. And this drunk guy is trying to sexually harass her in the park at night. And she's all weak and defenseless. Diana saves her. Cut to later in the movie when she starts gaining powers, the same man... She sees him and essentially beats the shit out of him to where we don't even know if he's dead or not. Leaves him in the street. Beats the shit out of him in revenge. The menace trash trope. That's what that is. That's also a a trope, if you want to call it, or the premise of a new movie called Promising Young Woman with Carrie Mulligan. Have you guys heard of it? I saw the trailer. And before I even saw Wonder Woman, I thought the same thing. Here, let me tell you about this. It's, It's a little crazy. The premise is about a 30-year-old woman who essentially pretends to be drunk at bars and waits for guys to hit on her and try to essentially rape her or harass her. And she reveals that she's not at all drunk and gets her revenge on them by mortifying them, embarrassing them. I'm going to give another spoiler. I read this today, but I didn't see the movie just because of this plot alone. It's like, why? I just don't feel the need to see it. I feel like I get I get it just from the plot. She ends up essentially being a martyr and dying in the end by this guy who she tries to pull this on, right? Is this where we want to go? Is this where we want to go to show that women are empowered? Listen, I'm the biggest Me Too supporter you'll ever meet. And you know what, Hollywood? I'm going to direct this at you. Well, maybe not so much Hollywood, but the outlets, the mainstream outlets. I wrote an essay about this this past spring how I actually thought celebrities should be more vocal about their Me Too stories to support women 
who don't have big platforms to come out and talk about it. I had our Kelly survivors say the same thing. They were like, say it, even if it's sacrifice for you, say it. No one picked it up. I don't know if they were afraid or what, but no one picked it up. So needless to say, I am the biggest Me Too supporter you'll ever meet. But stuff like this makes me question, is it now going too far? Is it now going too far to the point where you have this kick-ass history-making franchise like Wonder Woman? And the way that you're going to show the power of a woman is by taking revenge out of and kicking the shit out of a man who tried to harass you once to get some sort of revenge? Is this what we want to be portrayed? It just feels cheap to me. It, it honestly feels cheap. And it feels like it's almost taking advantage of the Me Too movement, you know? And plays into that men are trash trope. There's also the idea the woman has to sacrifice the love of her life so she can save the world. And people were uptight about this. And they said that we've seen this in other superhero movies, like in Star Wars. I saw one tweet that said like, oh, what? You know, what is this showing? Women can't have it all. You can't be powerful and have a man. Like, I, I didn't take that. I didn't get that takeaway from it. I'm a hustler. I'm a go-getter. And I, that's kind of real life. Like, I've sacrificed a lot to do and accomplish what I have. I was like, I get it. That's like not that far off. And by the way, I think women can have it all, which is why I will have all those things biatch. I'm just saying, it's not that far off. I don't think that's something to get your panties in a bunch about. It's the same thing as people were upset. I saw this in a few think pieces and on Twitter, like how unrealistic that Diana, this capable, I mean, do I even need adjectives to describe her? She's fucking Wonder Woman. How realistic is it that, what is it? 60, 70 years later we are now and she's still pining over pilot Steve who's Chris Pine plays. People were like, really, really? We're gonna show that? We're gonna show a woman who literally saving the world, but she's hung up on the fact that she lost the love of her life and hasn't moved on at all and won't even look at a guy who isn't him decades later. That part didn't really bother me. And that's where I'm gonna like poke fun at the woke a little bit. I mean, that whatever. Like I, I'm, I'm here for a good love story. I'm here for a romantic comedy. I'm here for that, you know, once in a lifetime love situation. That didn't bug me. Do I think that this man is worth holding out for 80 years? Not particularly. I mean, yeah, he's a funny little chap. He has ambitions. I like that he likes being a pilot. So that one to me is iffy. That one to me is iffy. That one to me feels like another orchestrated thing the studio did to make the audience happy, right? And it all makes you wonder, how far are these studios going to go? I'm going to get shit for this. There goes my press passes. How far are they going to go until they realize that these formulas aren't working on us? I wish that this movie was more about Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman 1984. And if that means Steve, her love interest, being part of that more, fine. So be it, whatever, that doesn't bother me. I would have preferred it to be more about them and their arc with Kristen Wiig as well, maybe in there somehow versus the Pedro Pascal movie. And I get it, right? They probably didn't want to fall into that thing of like, you know, Wonder Woman is a badass. We're not going to make the whole thing, you know, a love story and how she's hung up on Steve. And, you know, we want to avoid the woke culture and upsetting them by making it all about her love life when she's so capable. But it's like, you guys kind of already did that. So either like go for it, like go big or go home. You know, why was this movie about Pedro Pascal? about him as a businessman, an infomercial guy, a dad. Why do I feel like I know more about him than about Gal Gadot's character? You know, this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. And again, it might seem contradictory to my last episode, right? Right? Try to raise you men up. Try to raise you up because I know you're getting a lot of shit these days. I got your back. But, you know, I, I can't help but think, do people think that seeing men at the forefront will just succeed? You know, like my friend said, they're orchestrating these movies so that people will go see them, especially overseas. They'll tell their friends, they'll do well, they'll succeed. They have so many little factors, probably like the amount of times that they change the script, I'm guessing 45, to fit everything in and make it probably as confusing as possible for us. Like, how can you fuck up a superhero movie? It's pretty standard, right? Like maybe you actually should stick to the formula, but actually simplify it because you guys were doing a lot. But how much of these studies and these decisions go into making a man at the forefront? And again, don't take my willingness to cheer on men 
as that I think that they are better. No, we're just as badass and capable. You know, I've been talking about this a lot, like I said. As I pursue this podcast, even, I often get frustrated about how radio is still dominated by men. Have you noticed? Name one huge radio host. I had I Googled it the other day. Name one. Who's a woman? Jenny McCarthy with her serious XM show. Does anyone care? Howard Stern, Joe Rogan, Charlemagne. Look at late night hosts. Every Jimmy who ever walked the earth, James Corden, Steve Colbert, Trevor Noah, Chelsea Handler had her run for what, five seconds? It's annoying as fuck. Now, like I said in my last episode, I'm not going to feel like a victim because of it or like the system is somehow against me. I see it as people being too big of pussies to shake up the status quo. People are scared. People are scared. That's what's upsetting. It's like they only want to do something if they know it's going to work. It's like no one wants to really take a risk. Have the guts to do something different not just like cower into the status quo and the formula and the huge it's boring and sadly that's why i was disappointed i felt like this was just another example of that but maybe this is where it falls on projects like this and you know i hate to fall into that hole give patty jenkins more responsibility because this was such a responsibility i mean you guys she made what a million dollars for the first wonder woman i think she made around 10 million for this one right It is a responsibility, but male directors make movies that are trash all the time. So I don't want to put more responsibility on Patty and be like, you're a woman, you need to do better. Cause that's annoying as shit, but this is an opportunity. Like I said, I left the first movie so proud to be a woman. My mom and I, yeah, I even told Patty that when I met her one of the times after I, I saw it, right? Cause I met her many times, but I was like, yeah, we all, she was all excited. This was the opportunity. This was the opportunity to put women at the forefront, show Barbara Cheetah as this like sex dog who can kick your fucking ass to Wuhan. Focus on Diana, focus on Barbara and Diana. Why did I sign up to watch a movie about Pedro Pascal as this Wall Street oil obsessed man? I don't care about him. Fake news fake ass news. And again, when we do show women, it seems like lately being empowered, it's mortifying and destroying men. That's not cool either. Mm -mm. That misses the mark for me. I got to be honest, it does. Now, what's interesting to me is that the woke didn't point any of this out, really. I did my little homework. I did my research. And to the woke, This is where you guys are insane because you have the nerve to point out every time a person has a stray hair that's going in the wrong direction in a movie. And as something as obvious to me as this, no, you guys are quiet now. I found it interesting though, that these like woke outlets were just like, yeah, yeah. Bigger than ever, better than ever. Because it's, you know, for women, by women. It's like, they have to cheer it on out of, out of default out of obligation. It's like, oh, but you won't challenge it though? You're you're scared suddenly? You're scared? They can't critique it or point any of this out because that goes against the narrative, right? Like the man-hating trope. The man, uh, what is it? The men are trash trope. No one pointed that out. Real women supporting women is being, having constructive criticism and being honest. You know, what's funny is I actually read the reviews and I actually thought that it was the woke being uptight. I was like, oh my God, no one can just enjoy a superhero movie anymore. And then I watched it and I was like, I actually feel like these reviews were a little bit generous. Anyone else? Then though, there was a piece in the New Yorker with like, it was the other extreme, which is she basically gave an entire oral history of the feminist movement and was like, Patty Jenkins dropped the ball to be a history teacher in feminism. This is the hundredth year of the women being allowed to vote. And why wasn't that like, that's too far again. We're not trying to get a history lesson. We're trying to be entertained. I'm somewhere in the middle again. Give us the movie that we, we want. If you're going to pave the way, really do that you know? And that's the thing. I don't want to seem like I'm railing in on Patty Jenkins. Like I really admire her and I respect her. You know, it's funny is I actually interviewed her. It was a couple days after the news had broke that she was going to be making a record amount to sign on for Wonder Woman 2. And the outlet I was with at the time, Bustle, wanted me to ask her about that. It's kind of awkward, right? Like talking about someone's salary. And she said to me something really interesting. And I've always really liked her outlook, though. I don't know how much I believe it, but I like what she says. She said something like, 
no one deserves it. We can, all we can do is just strive, just strive for more. No one deserves anything. And I thought that was cool. It's like, she doesn't have that entitled view, right? You can tell she works her ass off for what she's gotten. You can actually look up the article. It's on Bustle. And there, here's a time I actually interviewed her too on the red carpet after Wonder Woman was so successful. Like I said, broke records, shattered records. I, it made like 250 million domestically. I don't know if it was the first, the numbers are crazy. I'm not going to rattle off numbers, but it broke records for uh, the highest grossing uh, female directed film. And I interviewed her right on the heels of all of this hype. And I said, when you go home at night, when it's just you, do you feel like a badass? Come on, who wouldn't? Wouldn't you be like, I'm a fucking boss. Hell, I feel like a boss after I shoot one podcast episode. I go out and I'm like, I'll have a venti today. Like I literally am on cloud nine. Come on, you're telling me that you're breaking all these records, making history and you don't feel like a badass. And what she said, here's what she said. It's really interesting. All right, lady. So first of all, I don't know if you remember me. I interviewed you at the junk. I had the leather top. Oh yeah. And I had you guys respond to the criticism. Do you yes. remember? Yes. That was me. Nice. Hi. Nice to it's see so you. Nice to see you again. You too. So, honestly, when you are in this world, when, when you go home at me, are you like kicking back and are you like, I'm a badass. Like, I'm No, boss. I'll never think Come that. Come on. No, no. I, that's Daddy. a dangerous thing to think. Nobody is a badass and nobody's a boss. We all can only try. And that's the secret. Because if everybody, in, like everybody in every couch in America can try their best, the moment never comes where you're done with any struggle. And oh it never God. will. And it never will. So isn't that interesting? It's kind of the same idea as the paycheck, right? It's like she won't pat herself on the back for, for just being deserving or for being a badass. Kind of saying we're all always striving to be better. Don't pat yourself on the back quite yet. We're still going. I kind of like that, actually. Now, in the moment, like I said, I don't know if I full, fully wholeheartedly believed her. How could you not feel like a badass? But I liked her attitude. I, I totally respect her and her work. It's just this is, again, because of all of these experiences I've had with her from the beginning. Lean into that, man. Lean into the power of the puss. Shall I say it again? And you know what? Maybe they should be a little more like, fuck yeah. Now that I think about it. I read that both Gal and Patty were making about 10 million each for this one. You know, that's always a big issue is like, why aren't women making the same as their, their male counterparts in film? Maybe they should be like, like Cardi B, money. I don't need the D, I need the money. Nothing wrong with that. Shout that shit from the rooftops and be like, and guess what, bitch, we need even more. Who is excited to see Chris Pine back? You know what's interesting about Chris Pine? A lot of people ask me what he's like because I met him so many. I met him on this movie set. He and Gal sat down with us. I met him on the first movie, Junket. I met him when he was promoting A Wrinkle in Time. And this really doesn't have anything to do with this, but I just kind of find it interesting because people always ask me like, what's he like? And I find him like kind of odd. I'm not going to lie to you. And I don't mean this in the shady way. I just feel like he's kind of like aloof or like not all there. Like, he's kind of like, eh. people ask me that this morning. They're like, what's he really like? He's so hot. I'm like, eh, not my fave. It seems like, I don't know. Maybe it's, my friend said, maybe he's in love with himself. I'm like, maybe. Something, something's going on there. I don't know if he's in his own little world. Maybe he's method acting all the time. It's like he's somewhere else. Maybe he's watching this movie because it left all of us being like, what the H just happened. So as my lipstick wears off, <laughs> this is what you get for drugstore lipstick. It just feels like we can do better. How about showing women in a really complex and sexy and intelligent and layered and unique way? And what's particularly insulting is knowing that this movie, it took $200 million to make this movie. And I happen to think that Patty Jenkins is a bit of a self-indulgent director. I thought that with Wonder Woman 1, right? Like there were parts when it drags and I was like, okay, like- we get it, you know, got a life to lead. And that's what's really eye-opening too. The scene that I was watching them shoot when I was in London, it would blow your mind watching how it panned out on screen. Do you know why? They were in the middle of London for a scene that was supposed to be in the streets of DC. And we went there and it was like a whole, it was the whole day. And it was a whole like production and there were extras everywhere in 80s costumes and 80s cars and American flags and the decor. 
Do you know how much it probably cost them that day to shoot that scene? And do you know what it was in the movie? It was literally two seconds of the movie when Diana and Steve are walking in the street and there's a hot dog stand next to them. Like they might as well have shot it in my front yard. Don't insinuate. I'm not saying that a woman shouldn't be given this responsibility and this amount of this much of money to play with when it comes to making a movie. But what I'm saying is we know the means were there. We know the means were there to make a kick-ass movie, $200 million. You can buy a shit ton with that. You can buy a lot of hot dog trucks with that. And again, you know, I can't stand that the woke picks everything apart. I hate that. And that's not what I'm doing here. I'm just merely pointing it out for you guys to have a little something to think about. And especially as this conversation keeps moving forward, right? It's funny because today, as I was prepping for this episode, I also saw the news that Taylor Swift fans were livid. I don't know if you guys saw this because in Nashville, this music mural of all these famous country stars, Taylor Swift's picture in the mural was replaced by Brad Paisley. Pretty savage. Was it because merely because she's a woman? I don't think so. Maybe because she hasn't been doing as much country music lately, perhaps. But this is a bit of a challenge to the woke. It's like, it's interesting to me what you guys get so uptight about when it comes to progressing moving forward and seeing things as an attack on women and other things to me, like like this movie, which is clear as day, it could have hit it out of the park in so many ways to show women as badass and like floppity flopped. So while I am first in line to take out the angry mob who has something wrong with everything, as you guys know, I'm going to say though, I'm going to say when it comes to this, like I say with my men, like I say with the sex life, don't settle, honey. I sure as hell am not. And neither should you. 